All right, the clip that we're about to watch includes a conversation between Joe Rogan and Steven Meyer. I'm gonna let him get into it. I'm gonna give you some of my thoughts on the back end. Respect to Joe Rogan for letting him come on and respect to Steven Meyer for saying yes and laying it out. Here we go, let's go ahead and dive in. I later found what I think are very, very persuasive arguments, both philosophically and scientifically. The thing that really convinced me as a, as a university student doing uh, studying philosophy was the, an argument known as the, the argument from epistemological necessity. The fundamental question in modern philosophy that has really just been a stumper and has led to this whole postmodern turn where people don't think there's no objective basis for any reality is the, is the question of the reliability of the human mind. On what basis can we trust the way our minds process all that sensory information? This goes back to, to, to Hume and Kant and some of the philosophers in the uh, Enlightenment period. And from that point forward, there was a great doubt. Maybe we can't trust our minds. Maybe we can't trust. Uh, we have all these things we assume about reality in order to make sense about reality. That every cause has an effect, for example. Um, but we can't prove those things. We have to use those assumptions in order to know anything at all. And hmm. the, the, I encountered this argument that su suggested, well, if, if we try to justify our ability to know the, the world around us by um, by empirical data, by things we observe, this was Hume's argument. You can't do it. Uh, if we, we, uh, he was a radical empiricist and found that in order to make any sense of the, of the sense impressions he had, he had to presuppose the uniformity of nature. But to prove the uniformity of nature, he had to make reference to s sensory observations. And so he was arguing in a circle. And so it came down, you couldn't justify the reliability of assumptions we, the, the, we make in our minds by observing the world you had to use those assumptions to make sense of the observations. But if you presupposed that our minds were made by a benevolent creator who gave us those assumptions in order to make sense of the world that he also made, then there was a principle of correspondence between the way the mind worked and the way the world worked, in which case we could trust the, the basic reliability of the mind. And this turns out to be one of the key foundational assumptions that gave rise to modern science. It was called the idea of intelligibility. Newton, Boyle, Kepler, the great founders of modern science, thought that, they, that nature had secrets to reveal. There were patterns there to be revealed that we could understand because our minds had been made in the image of the same rational creator who had built rationality and design and pattern and lawful order into the world. Do you, do you believe in evolution? I believe in, uh, well, that, that's a, I believe in microevolution. I believe that there are real evolutionary processes. I'm skeptical about what's called universal common descent, the idea that all living forms have evolved from one single common ancestor. I'm profoundly skeptical, uh, skeptical about chemical evolution, the idea that the um, non-living chemicals in a prebiotic ocean or prebiotic soup arrange themselves to form the first living cell. And I'm also skeptical about the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism, which as it happens, uh, so are many leading evolutionary biologists today. I attended a conference in 2016 at the Royal, convened by the Royal Society uh, in London, uh, Royal Society being the oldest and most august scientific body in the world. And it was con convened by a group of evolutionary biologists who were essentially dissatisfied with neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory that we learn in, um, in all high school and college textbooks. And, and many of them were saying, we need a new theory of evolution. The first talk at that conference was given by Gerd Muller, a prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist. And he simply enumerated the five major, uh, what he called explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. And his basic perspective was the mutation selection mechanism does a good job of, of uh, optimizing or modifying pre-existing forms. Um, it can generate small-scale variation, but it does a very poor job of explaining the origin of those <clears throat> forms. Think about, for example, the Dar Darwin's finch beaks. Great job of explaining how s variations in weather patterns result in changes in the shape and structure of the finch beaks. But that mechanism turns out not to do a good job of explaining the origin of birds or ma other m major animal groups in the first place. So uh, modification, yes. Innovation, no. But so modification it, over massive amounts of time, don't you think that would eventually lead to new groups? Before we get the answer to that question, I have to say, I just I love seeing Joe Rogan kind of sitting here, taking it all in, 
And I love what you get when he brings on an actual scientist onto his show who is coming from a theistic perspective because a question like, do you believe in evolution is, I don't want to call it a leading question, but it's a overly simplified question. And I love the response that Stephen Meyer gives here, which doesn't give a, you know, a direct answer to that question because the question is literally too broad to be sensical. So rather he explains the limiting factors within what most people mean when they mean evolution, which is microevolution, meaning kind turning into different kind. And he's saying when he's getting into Darwin Finch's here, that doesn't happen. We haven't seen any actual scientific evidence of kind turning into different kind. We've seen microevolution. Think about dogs, you know, wolves turning into all the different types of dogs, but we have literally zero evidence of kind turning into kind. And I love that he approaches it the way that he does. That being said, why am I still talking? Let's get back to Stephen Meyer. Because a lot of new groups have, they have similar origins or at least origins from uh, one ancestor. Well, time, like primates. Was, yeah, time was always the hero of the plot. But let, let me the, there couple, let me just run okay. a, a couple of arguments by you and let's see, see okay. what you think, okay? And I, I developed these in a lot of detail in my book, Darwin's Doubt. Um, uh, if we... Th- we uh, we now know, thanks to the genetic revolution, the the molecular biological revolution, that if you want to build a new form of life, you have at least ha- you have to have new code, because all all new forms of life depend upon uh, new anatomical, a fundamentally new type uh, type of animal, for example. Um, so you need new anatomical structures from, but the new anatomical structures require new cell types. New types. So, if you got animals that first come on the line have, and they have they have a digestive system, they have a gut. Well, you got to have enzymes that can service a gut that can process food. So, enzymes are types of proteins. Proteins are built from the informational code in DNA. So, anytime you want to get a new, it's just like in the computer world. If you want to give your computer a new function, you've got to provide new code. So, um, we have these long string, these long digital bit strings. Uh, a, C's, G's, and T's, not zeros and ones, but A, C's, G's, and T's in a, in a, in a, in a digital string, and we call that a gene. And if you have a, a section of DNA for building a protein, that's great, all works. Now, but if you want to build a fundamentally new form of life, you've got to have, you got to have new proteins to service the new cell types to build the new anatomical structures. Um, in our computer world, we know that if you start randomly changing the zeros and ones in a section of, genet- in a section of digital code, you're going to degrade the function of that code long before you come up with a new string for making a new program or operating system. That the the functional sequences are what are they're called? They're highly isolated in what's called sequence space. You 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 can change a few things and still retain function, but after ver- a very few number of changes, you're going to degrade the function, and long before you come up with a new function. Now the Darwinian mechanism. Um, starts with the idea that there are random changes in those uh, in those digital bit strings, those s- sequences of A's, C's, G's, and T's. And based on our experience in the computer world, we would expect that random changes are going to again degrade those strings long before they're capable of building a new protein. What is so interesting about this conversation is that the more that you actually study and learn about the complexity of life, the complexity of the cell, the complexity of DNA, the more that it becomes apparent that we're nowhere close to, for example, being able to create life out of non-life. And there's actually been literally now thousands of experiments that have been conducted trying to do just that, trying to create even the most basic form of life. Darwin himself said, that if the cell is more complicated than a billiard ball, then the theory of macroevolution is not true. We now know that the cell is full of literally hundreds of mechanisms within it, hundreds of different independent moving parts that each require the other one in order for the whole to be able to function. And in fact, in fact, I was just listening to another person called James Tour, who I can link in the description as well. And James Tour is on the cutting edge of nanotechnology. And what he is now uh, talking about is the fact that the more that we learn about the complexity of the cell, 
the more that the goalposts actually shift in terms of us ever being able to create something like that on our own. So we learn more and we realize, we think, for example, five years ago, we thought we're maybe, I don't know, 20 to 30 years away from being able to do this. Now, five years later, we realize we're like 100 years away from being able to do this. So the more that we learn, the more intricacy and complexity that we see, the more complexity that we see, the more that we realize that there is some type of a intelligence embedded within the very fabric of life itself. And that I'm going to go ahead and speculate here. I don't think that we're ever going to be able to do it because there is this divine fingerprint that exists at the heart of creation that is not able to be reproduced by man. There is, like what he said, in the same way that you see a code inside of a computer, you see this DNA code inside of inside of genes, inside of the genetic pool. You see this DNA code. Where does that code come from? That's information. Where does information come from? Does it come from matter or is it more likely that it comes from a mind? And there we are back to the man upstairs. All this being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, subscribe, comment, all the things, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye.